Good morning, Southland. Good morning to all of you online. You know, this is one of the best moments of our year is when people bring children before the Lord to the altars of the church and say, you know what, this is what we're all about. We're dedicating this child to the Lord. And the scriptures teach us this from Leviticus chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are away on a journey, when you are lying down and when you are getting up again. The Word of God tells us to bring our children up knowing him, loving him, and fearing him. And the psalmist tells us in Psalm 127, children are a gift from the Lord, they are a reward from him. This morning, our privilege is to dedicate Reuben William, or I'm sorry, well, yes, Reuben William Ruoff, Roof, sorry, we have Ruoffs and Roofs, and <laughs> and um, their par- his parents, Andrew and Daisy, are bringing little Reuben before us. The scripture that they have chosen for Reuben is Isaiah 41:10. Have no fear, for I am with you. Be not afraid, for I am your God. All right, little Reuben, come here, buddy. Okay, this is all we're doing today. (laughs) I'm just going to stand here. Reuben, Ruth, I anoint you with oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Andrew, Daisy. Today, do you pledge to bring Reuben up in the fear of the Lord by your love, your example, by teaching him his word, and and making him a part of the worship community? If so, answer, we do. And will all of you come alongside this family to help raise Reuben to love Jesus, support them, pray for them, and encourage them? If so, answer, we will. Lord Jesus, this little boy, beautiful boy, and gift to his parents. They've come today to present him to you, to raise him up, to love you, to know you, to point him to your great grace. Bless him, O Lord, and bless them as they raise him, and bless us as a church. Remind us all to come around him with your love and your grace, teaching him your word and your ways. We give him to you today, in Jesus' name, amen. I don't want to give him up, but I have to. Stand with us together. Let's worship together. There's a call comes ringing. Go the restless way. Send the light. Send the light. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. Send the light. Send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine.
We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom He is, and then we're reminded He loves us so much. So let's go to the Lord with that confidence in prayer this morning. Oh Lord Jesus, we approach your heavenly throne humbly and in need of your great grace. Thank you for dying for us, for rising again, for giving us hope, and for forgiving our sins. We recognize how deeply you love us as we read your word and experience your presence in our lives. Thank you so much for this gift. And people have come into this space today and are with us online who are hurting and suffering, and we pray for healing in Jesus' name, for comfort in grief, for direction when there are life decisions to be made. We pray that everyone would have confidence today that you are here and that you do speak, and you lead, and you help. And so we come with that confidence, not only to praise you and worship you, but also to trust you with our lives. And so in this moment, remind us of that, that you can be trusted, and give us that courage to take every day as an opportunity to honor you with faith, belief, and with obedience. And we give ourselves to you to that end. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory your unfailing love is better than life itself how I praise you I will praise you as long as I live lifting up my hands to you in prayer you satisfy me more than the richest feast I will praise you with songs of joy sing this last song together lift it up I search the world Oh, 
Praise his name together. Let's give him praise. Yeah, come on. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hey, let's just sing it one more time. I know we're supposed to be done, but let's do one more. What do you say? Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better. our time we must rise up and no longer disparage it's our time church to honor our heritage we have a savior he gave it all on the cross we stand beside martyrs who counted nothing as loss they took God's mysteries opened them up for us Stephen John the Baptist Bonhoeffer Jan Hus surrounded by a cloud of witnesses above it's now our turn to model his unending love our mission is one we cannot confuse, nor muddy up with some trite excuse. You say you're not well-versed, ready, or able. I think Moses even tried to use that fable. The time we have, it's now more urgent. If we should hear, well done, faithful servant. Yeah, church, it's our time. It's our time to confess the ways we're mangled, the sins and selfishness that have us entangled. Lust, greed, and pride, their path leads to the grave. Yet we return to our sins as if we're a slave. Can we survive in this putrid dead sea? I quote Paul, may it never be. So let's cast aside our individual leprosy and begin to leave a biblical legacy. There's a glorious prize awaiting to be won, and the way to win is to start to run. Let's lace them up and fight the good fight, become to the world both salt and light. Our life on earth is merely a vapor. Our chapter must move from pen to paper. So church, let's get to writing because it's our time. It's our time, church. We have what it takes to help the world from its slumber awake. To Jesus, we are his beautiful bride. Whom shall we fear with him on our side? We have each other. We are not alone. It's iron to iron in the combat zone. There's a promise of life full of adventure. As long as we give both talents and treasure, the workers are few, the harvest is plenty, with so many lives running on empty. Scores of people trying to cope. They've come to the end of their proverbial rope. Young eyes are wandering, looking for direction. Make sure we point them to his resurrection. The clock's ticking. We're on our dime. Hey, church, rise up. It's our time. And so we have a mission statement here about being and making growing followers of Jesus Christ. That's what we're all about. And so we've been plowing through this series called the four G's that define for us what a growing follower of Jesus looks like. And we've talked about being people of grace who've received it and give it. We've talked about growing in that grace then through his word, his spirit, through prayer, through teaching. And then we talked last week about being givers of, our, of ourselves and our resources and all of that to the glory of God and the needs of people. And we come to this moment where we focus on the go, the, 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 the response to everything that God has done in our lives. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever talked bad about the boss? <laughs> I, I mean, some people are like, you know, really stoic right now. <laughs> Be careful here. Um, but, but, you know, it, it happens. Sometimes we ridicule them, talk about uh, how we could do their job better than they are. And, and actually, some people actually compliment uh, the boss sometimes behind their back. Um, here, here is one quote from a boss, one manager who said, I don't always 
ask my employees how they're doing, but when I do, I walk away before they answer. <laughs> so I guess the truth is not all bosses are good bosses. You know, that, that can happen. But there's such a thing as a bad boss, and I get it, and so perhaps you've been one of those people who've talked badly about the boss uh, as you had lunch for an hour and a half. Uh, I'll pause there. But my question is, do you think the disciples ever talked badly about the boss behind his back? Do you, do you wonder about that? Because here's, here's why I ask. How interesting the look on their face would be when they see him risen from the dead. And now they think to themselves, he knows everything I've said about him. You know, I wonder, I wonder what their reaction is in that moment as they think about all of that stuff and their attitude and their behavior and even their response over the past three days to what all happened to him as he died on the cross. And I've often wondered how they felt when they saw him resurrected in this amazing human body that had been lifted from the grave. I, I think every appearance I at least would have been mesmerized. I, I don't think I could have taken my eyes off of him in every time he met with me to explain things to me. I, I probably at that moment would have said to myself, I have no trouble obeying this guy, believing this guy, because nobody's done that. Nobody's risen from the dead. And if we conclude he's risen from the dead, then certainly everything he said is true and we're following. So that becomes a pivotal moment when we come to the place that we believe Jesus Christ is actually risen from the dead. Yet there is this last appearance of his, this final command that he gave to these followers who'd been listening to him now over these days as he's appearing to him, resur them resurrected. And before he ascends into heaven, Matthew records this part of his story. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, this is the ultimate question of my life. Do I believe Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead? And, and when he said it, do I believe that now, knowing that and trusting that, that should inform the way I live my life? The things I say, the attitudes I have, the stuff I believe, the priorities I implement, should all of that be informed by the reality that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? If I say no, I think resurrection is a myth, then I'm going to obtain truth and morals and values and priorities from some other sources. It's not him. But if I say yes, I believe Jesus rose from the dead, a wise person will conclude that then his teaching should actually inform the decisions that I make and the stuff I believe. You see, you better have something spectacular, miraculous, supernatural to back it up when you say all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now think about it. The guy risen from the dead said that to his disciples. He has now shown them that he has, in fact, the authority to say something like that with his resurrection. Jesus is the one who has appeared to them after crucifixion. Therefore, he is the one with that authority to proclaim these things. And it really does boil down to this one fact in history, men and women. Jesus Christ died on a cross, was buried, and three days later rose from the dead. Now, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that message? He then appeared to his followers on many occasions until in this moment he was ultimately physically taken up 
into the clouds. Now, you've got a decision to make. Am I going to do things the same way I've always done them? Or am I going to do things differently? Am I going to prioritize the same stuff I've always prioritized? Or am I going to prioritize Jesus? You see, here's what I suggest you do first and foremost. Decide to make your passion following Jesus. Now stay with me because it's all about going, but you've got to start here. Decide to make your passion. You see, let's say that you start with that. I believe in the resurrection. Now what? What do you do with that belief? Well, I committed my life to following him. I'm seeing that as important enough for me to say, everything he wants from me, I'm happy to give him. I want his will for my life. And that's what the four G's have been all about. The idea is embracing that grace because I understand now who it is. I understand who has the authority. I understand this isn't some religion of the multitude of religions that I can choose from. I'm not just here because it's one on the buffet of beliefs that I can have. I'm here because I've concluded that he rose from the dead. And I worship him. That's a big word. I worship him because of this. Now here's the thing. Following is just that. Not only saying in my head, yep, I believe that he rose from the dead, and that's a fact I embrace, but deciding that reality will be the purpose of my life, the purpose of my life. The resurrection is what makes sense of the crucifixion, and without it, it's just another example of capital punishment in history. That's all it is. But the resurrection means now the cross and the crucifixion have all of the meaning in the world for my life. Now I see that I can receive forgiveness and grace from God because of what he did there. And, and, and it means I want to know what he said about my life and what it is designed to accomplish for the glory of God. Now, look, I, I get it. You can sit in a 30-minute sermon and feel like you're just being bombarded with all of these massive concepts that you want to get your life wrapped around. But at the same time, you've got to answer the foundational question. If I believe this, am I going to make it my passion? You see, before these witnesses of Jesus alive could move forward, they had to decide that they were going to make following him their passion. And let me tell you something, men and women, it was a whole lot harder for them than it is for us in this generation, in this country, and in this culture. As tough as we might think it is, it's nothing compared to the decision that those believers made when Jesus appeared. And that's why when they made a decision to make him and following him their purpose, I guarantee you they had to go home and have a conversation with their families. Because this was going to impact all of the ways that they were living and the way that they were going to use their resources and the way that they were going to spend their time and who they were going to spend their time with and whether or not they were going to take risks and put themselves in danger to follow him. See, you're here today for your own personal reasons. I mean, some are here with us or with us online because they think this is what you're supposed to do on Sunday morning. You know, this is how I was brought up, and so I come to church or I, I watch church or whatever it is. That's why you're here, and, and okay, that's great. Maybe you're here today because someone you really like invited you, and, and, I, and I appreciate you accepting the invitation to come, really. Or, or, or maybe you really came today because you are looking for something. You do want to find some kind of truth that you can tie your life to. And you can live your life with meaning and purpose that God had designed for you. Well, followers of Jesus have drawn this conclusion. That Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and because I believe that is true, I'm going to trust him with my life. And that's the first point of this whole final appearance that he had with his disciples after he had risen. You see, they showed up, here it is, because they told, he told them to. The bottom line is Jesus said, I want you to go to this mountain in Galilee and wait for me there. And so they simply did it. I mean, you know, you might say to yourself, look, I got stuff to do. You know, I, I, my, my dad's sick. My, my, my children are, 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 are ill. I got to get them to school. We got sports. 
You know, and he says, look, I, I need you to go to this mountain in Galilee. And they just did it. You know, they set it all aside. Why? Because of who told them to. Because their passion now was to follow him. And Matthew doesn't record if he told them why. He just told them to do it. And so they did. Now, their passion was following him, so what should my passion be? What should my passion in life be? What is my purpose in life if we can watch what happens with these first believers who saw him risen? We can take a lot of cues as to what he's calling us to do and be and believe and say in this generation. I have a friend, his name's John, and he graduated from high school and he went into the military and, and he was just living his life thinking that that was just his purpose. And it's great to serve, and I'm grateful for all of you who've served in the military. That's what he decided to do for the, for the sake of his country and his freedom. But in that time period, he lost his way. And he really struggled to figure out what his life was all about and ultimately left the military. And one day he met a believer, somebody who shared their story with him about what Jesus had done in their life. And it impacted him so much that he ultimately said, I want what that guy has. And he researched it himself and he came to the conclusion that he was going to follow Jesus. He gave his life to him, made Jesus his purpose, picked a wife who also had that same passion, and together now they are pursuing Jesus with all their hearts. And now they're telling other people about him. But look, it all started with a decision to make following him their passion. That's where it begins. In other words, with grace. You can't go until you've been totally engulfed in the grace of God. It's a simple story that I told you just there. It's how, like, how many people have come to believe in Jesus. Ultimately, everyone who's ever come to believe in Jesus has done so because they heard about him somewhere. Somebody told them. I mean, it might have been a billboard, but somebody opened up their eyes to the reality of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God helped them to believe. Now, here's the thing. John wants to share this with others. He understands that command, but before we get to that, let's look a little deeper into this. Jesus tells us what happens in life for a follower who's received his grace. That person makes a decision now to grow. Let's keep reading because we often think of this passage as just the Great Commission and it's all about going, but there's a whole lot of other stuff you got to get first. Look at verse 20 of Matthew 28. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Why do we want to grow in our lives and understanding the teachings of Jesus Christ? So our lives reflect our passion to follow. You see, he's telling us to not only decide to make it our passion, but model your passion to follow Jesus to the world. Show the world in the way you think and speak and live that he's alive in you. Now, here's the thing, men and women. Obedience proves faith and trust. Bottom line. If you say you have faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it must become your passion to obey his commands. That, that, that's just simple understanding that your life decisions reflect what you truly believe or have committed yourself to. And that's why we move from our decision to receive his grace to growing in our faith because we want our lives to reflect that decision to follow him. So we want to both learn about the teachings of Jesus and teach the, the teachings of Jesus to other people. Now, all of us who follow him also become models of these commands then to everybody else that's in our sphere of influence, our family, our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors, strangers. All of those people become people we can influence, and so we learn to model the life of a follower to even the people who wait on us at the restaurant, I'll pause here. We 
model who Jesus is to all of the people we intersect with in the world. And that's part of the third G. We give resources to show our attitudes, words, behaviors. We give generously to things so that people can see we are indeed passionate about following him. And you're here today learning and growing and worshiping and connecting with other believers so you can discover the joy of living out his wonderful and perfect will for your life. And, and that's the fourth G then, becoming a witness, a testimony to the world of what it means to discover his grace, grow in him, give your life to his service, and be passionate about living for him. But before you say anything about it, you choose to learn and obey his commands, living it before people as an example, as a model of his grace alive in you. And just as Jesus modeled and taught loving his enemies, so we too seek to model and teach loving our enemies. And just as Jesus modeled and taught to forgive those who've offended you, we choose to embrace that opportunity to forgive those who've offended us. And just as Jesus modeled and taught us to care for the poor and the needs of people around us, we too then care deeply for the poor. We don't just cherry pick the commands of Jesus we like and ignore the rest of them. We embrace all of them and live our lives so the world can see him alive in us. We model this passion of following. And men and women, if you're growing, it leads to going. Growing leads to going. And we live like Jesus lived and we taught, teach like Jesus taught, and we model our passion. To follow. You know, it's so great uh, when a, a new people come to Southland. If today's your first day, welcome. Um, but I love hearing the stories as to how people find out about us. It's often the first question I ask. You know, hey, great to meet you. How'd you find out about us? And some will say, I saw the sign, and that's great. Um, but others usually say, well, it's because this person told me about it. And this person is somebody I really respect, and off they go talking about that person who invited them. It was the example or the modeling of following Jesus that attracted them to accept the invitation to come to this place, to come hear about Jesus Christ. This is what we're called to do, to model his grace before others. And before you invite someone, Make sure you're walking according to his will. But listen, inviting someone is his will. Inviting people to hear the story of Christ is who we are as the church and what we are all about for this generation that God has allowed us to live in. People are watching you. I'm just going to tell you right now, people are judging you. And yet we always have that little joke, don't judge me. Everybody's judging you. And I, I get it. Who I am will be judged. Right or wrong, it will be. And so I want to desperately model who Jesus is and what he, how he's called me to live in front of the people who see me. So I keep growing, and I'm often confessing and repenting of those weaknesses, those sins, those acts that had no business in my mind, let alone in my choices. And yet with that, I start fresh, and I apologize who I need to apologize to, and I move on in my desire to give an example to the people in my life that Jesus is alive in me. Okay, I've uh, set the table, teed up the ball, now we're ready for the command. Here it is, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. 
So in other words, we transfer our passion to follow Jesus. Because not only did he command his disciples to do it, but they were then to teach others to do it that they led to him who would teach others, who would teach others, and here we are in 2024, still following him, still going, and still teaching others to go. Welcome to Southland, and welcome to following. You know, one of the things we often say around here as disciples of Jesus or followers of Jesus is that his last command should be our first concern. That we should be wanting to tell this amazing story to others. It's interesting. Imagine if these followers who had witnessed Jesus risen from the dead kept that a reality, a secret between them. I mean, the Apostle Paul said that over 500 people witnessed him risen from the dead. What if those 500 said, isn't it great that he chose us? Now, let's not take too many risks, you know, because we don't want to get out there and because there's only, you know, a few hundred of us. We, maybe we ought to be careful. Or I think my faith is personal, and so I don't want to push it on anyone else. I'm so glad they didn't say that. I'm so glad that they told the world at great risk to their own lives of how wonderful it is to see him, experience him risen from the dead, and to know he can be followed. Well, perhaps the decision on their part was to overcome this idea they won't believe anyway. You know what? It's not our job to make anyone believe. It's simply our job to give them the truth and let the Holy Spirit take it from there. But we have that job, that calling, that commission from Jesus himself. Remember, risen from the dead, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He is calling us as followers to tell people about his love. When Jesus told this, these disciples at his final appearance, go and make disciples. He wasn't just talking to people called to the ministry. Uh, he's talking to all believers. He, be a follower, yes, I get it, and that's what a lot of people say, well, I just wanna be an example of Jesus in front. But he also says, and make followers. Every follower, men and women, you are an evangelist, a missionary, a minister, a preacher, you are the one to bring people this good news. He was talking to every follower to tell others, teach others, and to pray for others. Every follower who is called to him is called to share the gospel with the world. You are the one for your family, your friend group, your colleagues, the people that the Lord puts in your path, you're the one. You may be the only one who tells them about Jesus. And it's your opportunity and call. Today, I believe the Lord wants to mobilize this church and in turn mobilize you as a follower of Jesus, passionate about him, to go tell his story. Now, look, I get it. Not everybody's going to embrace it. In fact, the Bible tells, tells us most of the people won't embrace it that you share it with. But, you know, that's the problem with us. We're all so insecure, you know? We, we don't want anybody to have a bad feeling toward us. Oh, okay. Let me, just, let me just love you with truth, all right? I don't want anybody to have a bad feeling toward me, so I guess I really don't care where they spend eternity as long as they like me. Oh. That's not who I want to be. And I know that's not who you are and want to be. So why wouldn't we tell them? It's, again, even if they don't receive it well, you've put it in there and given the Spirit now the tool he needs to draw them to Jesus. Look, you believe he rose from the dead. How cool is that? And that is a story to tell for people to discover not only how to give my life now purpose and meaning, but I do not have to fear death or the grave because of this wonderful story that somebody told me. If you thank God for the grace experience in your life, 
then show that appreciation by telling someone else about it so they too can enjoy what you now enjoy, peace with the Lord. Look, just be intentional about it. I mean, there are different ways to do that. You can just serve people, and maybe they'll be impressed with your serving enough to know when to ask why. Or just invite people. I mean, okay, maybe you feel like you don't necessarily know how to say it. Well, then bring them into places where they can hear it. Invite them. Maybe you are a person who really does understand why you believe this, and you can articulate it. Go find the people who love to debate and debate. Whatever it is, whoever you are, just become intentional about sharing your story and his story with the people you love. Just be intentional about going. And, and just like the disciples, might have been a little intimidated when they first heard that. I mean, let's face it, he's calling them to go tell people about him in a place where they just killed him. And so that would be a little intimidating. And so here's what Jesus said to them and what he in turn says to all of us. Verse 20, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You do not go alone. You go with him in you, with you, and enabling you to share his story with the people he calls you to. You know, I, I, I'll never forget it. When we first moved into this building, my friend Lloyd invited his friend Michael to church. And Michael, while when coming here then, discovered something he really didn't that had, hadn't known before. I mean, he'd heard of Jesus. I mean, he thought he was part of a church, but he discovered that he could give his whole life to Jesus and that that would give him purpose and meaning. And so Michael sold out his life to the Lord because Lloyd invited him. And, and then Michael brought his, his wife. And then ultimately, Michael and his wife began growing and serving and leading here at Southland. And then ultimately, adopted children who now know Jesus and, and want to follow him and serve him. He's standing right up here this morning playing bass. All because Lloyd invited him. And look... A hundred may say no before one says yes, but it's worth it to go and tell them the wonderful story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that resurrected Jesus is alive in you. You know, it starts with personal passion, so it moves to a passion to give it away. And when Jesus, in one of his appearances with the disciples, he was explaining this to them, and Luke records it actually in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when he said, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In other words, he's saying, when you believe and receive his Holy Spirit, you will go, and when you go, you will have impact. You will have influence, and you will change someone's life and someone's eternity because you chose to trust and obey his command, his command to go. Look, look, I love you all so much, and it would be so fun to just sit up here and talk all the time about how much Jesus loves you, pats you on the back, and kick you out, say, get out there, you can do it. But it's another thing to bring the challenge before you, and maybe the hardest challenge of all of our life, to have the courage to tell others about him. I'm calling you, through his word and his spirit today, to listen to his command, and make a decision to be passionate about following him, passionate about modeling his life, and passionate about transferring that faith to others. Let's pray together. Jesus, we don't want to just go through the motions here this morning. We want to see people make a difference, and make a change in what's important. 
And so we're asking you, Lord, to speak to the hearts of those who perhaps are hearing about you for the first time this morning. Awaken them to your wonderful love, grace, and mercy. Help them to choose you today. But Lord, we also pray for the believers gathered here. We ask that you would awaken us to the joy of sharing your story with others. Challenge us in this moment to give ourselves completely to all your commands so that you will be glorified in the way we live and the way we speak. Go ahead, you pray. You respond to what you've heard this morning and ask the Lord to give you courage and joy in going and telling about him. You pray. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. Thank you for what you've done for me. And I pray that you would help all of us now to be so grateful for that gift that we can't help but share it with others. Help us today, Lord, to believe, receive, and go. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, maybe this morning while we're singing the last song, you have someone on your heart right now that you know needs to hear about Jesus. And maybe you'd just like to bring them and, and kneel here in your mind and heart and just pray for them and ask the Lord to give you the courage. I, just respond any way that the Lord's leading you. Let's stand, let's sing, and you make a decision today to go and tell his story. Let's sing together. Let's sing. out of here don't we now this has been great to be together in this place and and with us online but ultimately uh, the mission now is to go out and not only be disciples but make disciples and so let's go let's go do that and i mean there's no greater joy than seeing someone we shared christ with come to believe in him I hope you believe that too. If those of you who are with us online, stick around for a minute. And Ben's going to talk a little bit more about how you can respond to worship today at Southland. And I'm just telling you as well, get out of the house and go tell someone about Jesus.